Hi everyone, this is Yuval Ron, and you're listening to the Chana 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 podcast, and I'm very happy to be a part of it this time. <clears throat> Hi everyone, welcome to another episode of my podcast. Uh, we have a special guest today, all the way from Germany. We have Yuval Ron joining the podcast. Hi Yuval. Hello, hello Chana. Yeah, how are you doing this morning? I'm doing fine. How are you? I'm good. Uh, it's it's uh, 5 p.m. here in Manila. Uh, it was a great, good, good day today. The weather was good. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, we're still uh, experiencing some nice or moderate weather here. It's not too cold. Not yet, anyway. Right. So, you all, where are yeah. you? Where are you uh, based in Germany? I live in Berlin. Oh, okay. Lived here. I lived here since 2012 for eight right. years. So how's the situation in Germany with the COVID pandemic and lockdown and everything? Um, it's, it's changing all the time. I mean, uh, I don't know how it is in Manila, but uh, here, of course, we had this famous lockdown in the spring, in uh, March or April. Um, and then a few months were kind of more moderate and then about a month ago or two months ago it started to climb again so we're actually now in a, an all-time peak um, in the sense of uh, how many positives and all that right. um, and they and they did of course declare a lockdown uh, for now it's partial and they're talking about uh, some uh, further steps meaning a complete lockdown yeah, not very nice and especially not so good for the for the music situation. Um, but uh, yeah, we have to deal with it. Yeah, right. Um, how did it? Uh, how did the lockdowns affect your music? I mean, do you do you regularly perform live, or you you do mostly uh, other work? Um, well, I don't. I, I perform live. Uh, I sometimes have shows and uh, some tours. I was right. supposed to have uh, two gigs in the summer, which were obviously canceled. Um, we were supposed to play a festival in Romania and some other gigs in Europe and in Israel, and none of that, none of that happened. Um, and I don't know what will be the next summer. I really hope that by then <clears throat> things will be, uh, things will sort themselves out. Uh, and actually they have to sort themselves out long before then if we want to book anything, because at least in Europe, uh, you have to book at least a half a year in advance in order to get a, any kind of gig date, you know? Right. So yeah, unfortunately, uh, nothing is certain at, the, at this point and it doesn't look very good for next year either. I think until they actually come up with a vaccination, uh, it's going to go on like this. Right, right. Uh, <laughs> yeah, even in, in Manila. Yeah, so we are in Manila, we are actually I think right now we are seven months into the lockdown. We've been in lockdown for seven months. Uh, now, uh, now the now the now the rules have actually relaxed, uh, but uh, but we are still in a lockdown. So we are still staying at home. <laughs> yeah, <clears throat> it's uh, wow. it's really affecting you know, especially <laughs> mental side of things because we are, I'm like used to going out a lot and. Now I have to stay at home, and you know. Uh, anyway, that's uh, <laughs> we'll have to we'll have to do yeah. it so that we can uh, have a better year, maybe next year. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I hope so. I mean, there are at least uh, a few advantages uh, in this uh, situation. I mean, there are many disadvantages, obviously, and uh, we don't need to to discuss that, of course. But um, one advantage is that you have more time to do other things that uh, you always wanted and maybe maybe you couldn't always do it or didn't have the time. For example, I, um, you know, the latest video I did, like the, I just edit my own videos and do the post-production and everything uh, uh, for Universe, the tune. Um, I think that was thanks to the lockdown. Otherwise, I don't know if I would have the time because we had the tour this summer you know, we were supposed to have it. And if I needed to prepare for that, I don't know if I would have the time, you know, to actually create that video. Mm. So it's not all bad, but it's bad. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. And now, yeah, now I'm uh, preparing a new live set. I 
you know, with the hopes that next year uh, we will have something going on and then we can actually use it. Right. So you all, uh, uh, how we got connected is, I think you saw my uh, a podcast with uh, Jason Goebel, uh, who was yeah. part of Cynic. Uh, yeah. I, I, I also saw some of your t- videos or photos, you were actually wearing a Cynic shirt. So are you a fan of Cynic as well? <laughs> of course. Of course. I love, I, I love Cynic, you know, Focus, the first album um, was a huge um, game changer for me because I grew up with metal. Right. Um, but then I heard Focus, you know, after hearing all kinds of metal, and that was like a whole new world open because you know what is what is this guy Sean Rayner doing on the drums like the snare is not coming where it should come <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah and and you know everybody is a top player and okay so uh, there are great players in metal anyway right but but still you know they did things so different and it still sounded metal so for me it was like you know the gate the gate to this huge world uh, called, let's say, music, basically, because really it is, it's it's prog and it's fusion, and it has these influences from from you know if it's Sean Malone then it's Jaco uh, as a I guess as a major influence um, or of course Alan Holdsworth and 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 Cheek Korea and all these you know so I actually that made me actually take up uh, jazz lessons and. Then my teacher, you know, like my, at the time, he he heard them and he said, yeah, yeah, you should definitely check this guy out and that guy out. And I was like super amazed. I was obsessed with finding out about new music back then because it was so cool, you know, like I right. really loved it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's, yeah. And that's when I became, I can, I can never say that I, that I'm a jazz player because I'm not really, it's not my calling. Yeah. But but I did learn jazz. I did study jazz, and I'm able to play decent <laughs> jazz. Um, but yeah, but that's when I became jazzy in a way. Yeah, right. Um, and of course, uh, took out a lot of, you know, dug out a lot of solos from Alan Holdsworth, from Chick, from anyone basically that I liked. Um, yeah, but we'll probably talk about that more later. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so going back. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about your like early childhood and then how do you like first got into music? Yeah, um, so I grew up in, in Israel, in Haifa. It's a city relatively in the north of Israel. Mm. Um, and um, I, did, I don't come from a musical family per se, meaning my parents are, are not musicians. <laughs> But uh, my dad really loves music. So we had a record player. And um, I remember that I, when I was very young, I mean, maybe two years old, I would already use that record player. And I would just take my own, like, I, I would just take by myself records and put them and listen to them. And my parents told me that I would sometimes listen to, um, to music on repeat, you know, on a loop, the same tune over and over and over again. Um, and there was classical music and some uh, light jazz and maybe some rock. Steely Dan was there, I remember. Um, you know, my dad really had a nice record collection. And that's basically how I started being exposed to music, you know. And uh, until today, I sometimes listen to some of those records because they are so good and they, so, they survived the test of time even right. when I grew up, you know. So yeah, it was uh, my first exposure to music. Um, I did play a little bit of piano at age six, I think, but I didn't continue. Uh, I just didn't have um, the patience to sit down and really learn music properly. So mm. after a year, I think I, I stopped. But then at age 11, I got my first guitar. And then I, I guess I, I matured a little bit and I was also starting to be obsessed with rock and metal and all that. So I really loved music. Ever since I remember myself, that's all I wanted to do really. Um, and and yeah, ever, you know, the rest is history. Like uh, I just picked up the guitar and I had fortunately some good teachers that uh, taught me, you know, the, the basics. Um, and then I just learned a lot by myself. 
Mm. And that's how I grew up. I, I got exposed to metal, I guess around 13 or so. And I listened to Metallica, to Slayer, you know, the, the trash metal and, and then more to either power metal or later death metal and black metal, and everything, you know, I really loved it. Um, and rock, some rock and guitarists, of course. Uh, yeah, and whatever I, whatever I liked, liked enough at least, I, I just took out, you know, I picked it up and I tried to play phrases from whoever guitarist, whichever guitarist that I wanted to play. So that's um, partly how I learned to play guitar, basically, mm. by just uh, imitating other bands and of course being in bands myself. That was also a very good experience. Um, so by the time I was uh, 18, I was already in a couple of bands um, which played metal and we toured a lot uh, in Israel, not uh, internationally, but yeah, I mean, it was great experience um, in the sense that I just learned a lot, you know? Um, right. Yeah, and then I picked up job and, and all that stuff that I told you about. Right, so uh, growing up in Israel, can you tell me a little bit about the the scene back then in Israel? Uh, because we don't really hear about that much about the metal scene or the rock scene in Israel. So can you tell me a little bit about what you experienced? Uh, yeah, I'm, I mean, I sure, I'm sure that you know, for example, Orphaned Land, right? Yes, right. I mean, yeah, so they come from Israel and they're one of the most famous bands. I don't know if they're like in the front line. Of course, they're not as famous as Iron Maiden or something, but but they are known, right? Yes. So there, there was a scene uh, at least in the 90s, and I, I don't know how it is today, but at least in the 90s, um, there was a very nice scene in Israel. You know, a lot of good bands. Not all of them became famous, but a lot of good bands and um, and a lot of you know many fans that came to the shows. Uh, that every time that there was some international band here, uh, we we went and saw them, uh, and 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 it was active. It was active. There were every weekend there were metal nights um, in Haifa, in Tel Aviv, in Jerusalem. So at least in the big cities, uh, there was quite a scene actually, and uh, that was good. You know, it was a great time to to be a metal fan, also in Israel, even though it's not the center of the metal world, of course. But uh, it was it was good enough, you know. And uh, a lot of the guys that I played with or knew, uh, some of them at least, really became successful at what they do, like Orphan Land. Um, uh, I was also uh, taking part in the hardcore punk scene. I wasn't really a punk, but but I was, uh, you know, I was playing it. Right. Uh, useless ID. I don't know if you know Useless ID, for example, the band. Uh, they became quite famous in the hardcore punk world. Right. And, you know, they used to do bands nights together and stuff. So, yeah, it was, you know, it was a really good uh, practical education in music. You know, right? Like really grasping this this basic world of rock, let's say. Um, and there's also there are also some great jazz artists in Israel. You know, Avishai Cohen came originally from Israel. The other Avishai Cohen, Anat Ford. You know, so many actually. I, in jazz, actually, it's a it's a powerhouse. You know, like because there are good teachers and good schools there for that. Right. So many of them, you know, went later to Berkeley or New York or wherever. And uh, yeah, so yeah, I was fortunate enough to to learn with some of the teachers, you know, that that are teaching there so many students, and uh, and they really have the knowledge, you know, like uh, whether it's uh, guitar or jazz or or theory, music theory, all that stuff. Um, I never, I was, I never went to a music school, but I did uh, take some lessons with the teachers who teach in those schools. Right. Um, to the point where I felt that I'm uh, that I'm independent enough to do my own thing and confident enough uh, to to kind of understand the game, you know. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. I was I was always the practical guy, at least in when it comes to music, because I'm also a software engineer and that I really studied in a, in the college. But uh, when it comes to music, I was always like very practical. I just had music in my head and I wanted to take it out and be be able to play it. And that's all I care about. I don't need more than that. Right, right. Yeah. 
actually when i was uh, searching for your music in uh, in spotify and also in youtube there is also another yuan ron music artist yeah. right there's another one who who does like acoustic and uh, more of a folk or i think that sort of music right <laughs> yeah, yeah i was like i know him uh, obviously uh, fate has um, got us together right. in the sense that uh, sometimes i'm getting emails that are meant for him and stuff like that um and uh yeah yeah he's a very nice guy and a very talented musician uh, doing a completely different uh, style of course uh, he's more in the world music scene right uh, I, I, always, I always laugh that uh, he's doing world music and i'm doing uh, out of this world music <laughs> right and, uh, <laughs> yeah but he's really good i mean people should check him out because yeah he lives in la right um, we never met we never physically met but um who knows maybe one day you know but you will run meet you will run do <laughs> Yeah, because I I I I I do yoga, so I saw he 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 released like a latest his latest album was a prana album, uh, like yeah. prana music. So <laughs> I would definitely yeah, listen yeah. to that. <laughs> yeah, he's doing all these um, meditation albums, and uh, not, not only he played with Omar Faouk Takbilek and, and others. I don't know him that, like his music too well, but uh, yeah, I like what I heard. <laughs> right. Yeah. So uh, you also uh, playing guitar, and then how did you? When did you get into like composing uh, music? Uh, I always compose music. Uh, to be honest, you know, ever since I'm a kid, I just wrote songs mm. uh, with whatever influence I had at the time. You know, I used to listen to to rock, to grunge. Then I just wrote songs Nirvana style or Green Day style. Then I grew up a little bit, became a metal fan, started to write songs in the, uh, in the style of metal. But I, I always had this individual feeling, so I was always looking for my own angle in things. Mm. I didn't really try to walk anyone. And, um, and yeah, sometimes it drove some, some of the other musicians I played with nuts because, because they, they wanted to do something very, very specific uh, in the sense that you know they wanted to sound like this or like that, you know, and then I'm coming up with all uh, all these ideas, these weird ideas, and uh, they didn't always appreciate it, you know. But then I realized, okay, I have to find um, the right people to work with. Even if you, uh, some people are great players, they're not always open to to other things you know, or mm. to to finding new angles and stuff like that. Um, and that's when I. That's when I realized that maybe in the jazz world or the fusion world, not the, not the jazz because jazz is like there are also very many purists there, but at least in the fusion world because it's still a very um, evolving genre and mm. it's not not by far anything that ended or you know is set already. Then you know people who like modern jazz and fusion and all that stuff they are much more open and of course prog. Uh, even there, there's purism unfortunately, but you know not for most. So I found my, you know, my own kind of people uh, to, to, to make music with. And, uh, and that really helped because I could find people who really represent what I want to do or me uh, on their instrument. So I played with the Residents of the Future, my former band, which had a few incarnations, but they were always incredible players and they really dug what I'm coming up with. Uh, and we toured the world like that. We, we mm -hmm. played everywhere, basically in Europe, in North America. We've we reached even as far as New Zealand once. Yeah, it was really good. Mm. And uh, yeah, also a very good experience. Of course, uh, it was a different time already that, you know, I, I became more proficient on my guitar and, and it's, it's more me, meaning like more personal music that I wrote uh, that represent me even until today. But yeah, I mean, uh, that that is my composing career. Basically, I just always tried to take out what's in my head. And I didn't really care about genres anymore or styles or whatever. Uh, it was just whatever is going on. Uh, try to make it a cohesive, coherent experience. But that's that's all that matters, basically, about the compositions. Right, right. 
<clears throat> so uh, like when i was listening to your album so you put out your album in 20, 2019 right somewhere in in the uni in this universe yeah about a year ago yeah yeah so is is that album like when was that uh, songs recorded was it a uh, long time coming or was it like just did la just happen last year uh no no it was a process i mean i evolved a lot with this uh, album i started writing for it i think around 2015 or 16 you know just gathering ideas um but i I changed a lot at that time musically mm. and also learned a lot about music production. I I built the studio. This is uh, my home studio. So I call it the bubble because I spent so many hours here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, and it's it's a very safe haven to make music and whatever. Right. Um and and yeah, and I just studied the studio, meaning I learned how to produce music, how to become an audio engineer, uh, and of course, took up some more guitar ideas and, and executed them. And one thing I did learn, and that's going to composition, is how to how to find find a way to always come up with a good, or what I consider as good uh, tune. Uh, and I'll tell you the secret. The secret is that no matter how complicated your ideas are, um, or how much more you want to do in, you know, in the sense of arrangement or production, you got to keep a very coherent line on the bass, on the basis, not the bass guitar. Mm. So what I do is I just pick up the guitar, and sometimes not even that, and I just sing into the mic whatever lines I want. Even if I'm not a very good singer, I mean, I, I can sing, but it's not like my main instrument, but I do play it. Mm. Um, sometimes it's improvised, sometimes I'm thinking, thinking about it uh, in advance, but the idea is to play it as, uh, on, like, uh, as a flow, you know? And if you're playing it as a flow, you're almost guaranteed that no matter what happens later, the song will come out great. Because because you already have a very natural bass to it, right. so if you if you have if you have a good bass, if it can work well with just guitar and singing, then you know you can complicate it later all you want, and you can add whatever you want, like other instruments, or parts, or or produce this and produce that, but the bass will be already will already be there, so it can all grow from that. But if the bass is not there, then nothing you would do would work because because it will just not have a solid base that's all right so so that's that's how i write tunes now maybe another interesting thing it, it didn't start now it was pretty much always like this but um i i compose usually from the titles which means i have the title first i need to have a strong title that um creates music in my brain right But once I have that, once I have that, I have something to talk about. It's kind of like going up and making a speech. And uh, if you don't know your subject, then what are you going to talk about, right? Right. You can improvise, and maybe for some musicians it works, right? I'm not saying that it's uh, the one method to create music, but for me, I have to have it, uh, so to speak, um, thematic, right? So that I have something to talk about in the tune and more largely in the album as a whole. Um, and once I have the theme, it's easier for me to come up with music, which is also uh, coherent to the theme. It's not just any idea that I have. It's ideas that are relating to um, to whichever the subject is. And I think it's important. I think in jazz, for example, uh, it's not really happening a lot because it's not really based on songs. Mm. Um, and then... And then many jazz players just come up with whatever ideas they have, and that's fine, you know, like it's a different aesthetic. Um, so that aesthetic is music that sustains itself. But for me, and that's one of the reasons why, I'm, why I don't consider myself a real jazz player, is <clears throat> that um, it, it has to be something external to the music. It's, it has to be something about something else. It cannot just be a bunch of chords and, and licks, you know, it's not meaningful enough to me mm. to say. Uh, yeah, so that's why it has to correspond with the subject, and then 
for me at least, I'm guaranteed to have a coherent composition or, or even solos, you know, even the solos, I really tried um, to play a solo which is corresponding with the idea of the tune and not just let in any kind of idea that I have. And many, many musicians, especially the jazz guys, they don't really like that. Not always anyway, they, or they don't understand why it's necessary to them. For them, it's really like, okay, we have a theme, but just improvise it. It doesn't matter what happens inside because wherever it takes us is great. Right. I'm not like that. I, I don't really um, hook up with that idea. That's why right. I'm more of a composer. That's one of the things that I realized when I started to create this album that I really have to write more. I really have to compose more uh, because in Residents of the Future, in my old band, it was, you know, it, it was, yeah, it was partly composed in the sense that there was a theme and maybe sometimes some arrangements or some impro improvisation structures or bridges, that kind of stuff. But I would say 80% of it was, was soloing, following over our improvisa imp improvisation structures, right? right. Um, and then I, I felt that a lot of the ideas that I have are not really coming into life. Because when you're basically improvising, then you can only do what's going on in the moment, but you cannot really come up with an arrangement mm. and not just for me, for other instruments too. And, and just give the players that and say, okay, you, pl you play like, like this part and you play that part. But I realized, okay, all those great ideas are not coming into life. They're not seeing the light of day, so to speak. And, and it's a shame because I really want them in. And then I realized, okay, I, I got to do um, a reset in that sense and really first understand what I want. And that's what I understood. And then just, I started to write a lot and arrange a lot and produce a lot. So it comes at the expense of solos and, um, you know, interplay and uh, spontaneity and the improvisation. There's a price to everything, of course. But on the other hand, I'm much more happy. I'm happier with with the result because it gets in almost everything that I wanted to, to make, you know? Right. So yeah, it's all a trade-off in the end. <laughs> yeah. So when I was listening to your album, I mean, what I felt is that uh, it sounded more or more of uh, orchestral sort of music that uh, it felt like a full orchestra is, uh, is playing that songs. And uh, it felt, uh, also, because of the maybe because of the song titles and album titles and all that, it felt like you know this can be like a movie soundtrack. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, many people told me that. Many people actually told me, yeah, I mean this is cinematic prog, and I adopted the 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 term because it's so you know spot on. Right. Uh, yeah, we just call it cinematic prog or fusion. Yeah. Yeah, it's. Uh, yeah. It, I'm, glad, uh, I'm glad that you, you find it like that because because I really, I mean, I always like um, modern classical music, especially. Um, and uh, once I got back to it at some point, that was also one of the motivators to create the album. I, I went to um, a library here that has a lot of uh, um, part partitur, and I'm not sure, scores, scores. Um, it has a lot of scores for all kinds of. Um, uh, pieces by all kinds of composers, of course, but uh, I was interested in um, in Holst, the planets, for example, in Prokofiev. That was really like some of those motivations. Um, yeah. So I'm not a great notes reader. I'm still a guitarist, but I can read the scores uh, a little bit uh, or notes. And I just sat with the music and the scores and I realized what a great thing it is. Um, and I also got more into film music. I always liked it, but it was kind of in the background, and it's still, I would say, in the background because I'm not an expert in these things. But, but um, I, I did, I didn't, I, I kind of understood the point. I started to understand, you know, why do that, hmm. and I realized that there, there's a reason why everybody always told me I should uh, go and make film music, which I didn't yet, anyway. But, but I said, okay, I, maybe I'm not in the film music business yet, but at least I can take. Um, some elements from that and incorporate it into my own music and that's what I did and that's why it sounds to you like that and I'm happy that uh, people understand this so clearly right <clears throat> so with regards to the somewhere in the universe album um, uh, 
uh, who did you work with for that album? Who were, who were doing the other instruments? Who were playing the other instruments? So um, I played guitar and I sang some vocals, of course, but um, there were uh, three more super, super talented musicians. One of them you know very well. Uh, so there is Matt Powell on keyboards, uh, there's Roberto Badoglio on bass, and there's Marco Miniman on drums. Right. Uh, and Marco, of course, uh, I'm pretty sure most of our viewers know, the Aristocrats drummer, and he played before with Steven Wilson and with Satriani, and who not actually, <laughs> he's, he's everywhere. Right. And uh, yeah, it, it was a great um, boost. All of them were a great boost to the album adding a lot of talent and creativity. Uh, with Marco, uh, I couldn't really meet to do this. So it was online, everything was online. With the other players, I, we really uh, sat here or at Matt's place. Uh, you know, I remember sitting with Roberto, the bass player, and we just um, started to record and he came up with these most amazing ideas. And I was just like a, like a film director, just, um, directing him into some directions that I want or something like that. But very fast, he came up with this or with that and some long lines on, on Phoebe the tune or, or some really great grooves on astronauts. All these things happened together. And I really liked that way to work. I, I, you know, it was a producer way, right? Like the musical producer, not the technical one. Right. Um, and, and it was great because on one hand there was his incredible talent and, and instrument um, capabilities. And on the other hand, there was me with the direction and vision and all that. So together it worked incredibly well. And the same, ga same goes to the other players. With Marco, for example, we exchanged some emails. I mean, he would send me something and 90% of it was good. You know, I just took it. But then I already told him in advance that I have a very, very specific um, image in my mind for a specific um, for specific uh, parts or specific moments. Um, and so he wasn't surprised to see that I want this punch and that punch, you know. So, okay, it took, but not too many rounds. It took uh, maybe, I don't know, one, two, three rounds and it was in, you know, mm -hmm. nailed it in the end. So it was great to work like that and it was very interesting. Of course, it's always better if you can work um, together or in person, but he lives in the States, so it was a little hard. We actually never met uh, when we, uh, until we did the album and uh, only, a, only a couple of months after the album was released, which was about a year later, uh, we actually met here because they were on tour. Right. Um, yeah, so yeah, but still it works, you know, like I, I, I came very prepared to these sessions. I mean, there was a lot of music uh, written, of course, it, like I said, it's more written than before. Uh, but the, the real thing was that there were both charts. Like I, I wrote, I don't write everything for rhythm section. I don't like, you know, to tell the rhythm section every, like every little bit, but there were moments that I did write when, when it was important or meaningful for me. Um, and the rest I told them, okay, take the demo. I prepared really detailed demos um, with rhythm section, with every synth part, with every guitar part and all that stuff, you know, it wasn't the final solos, but but everything else was pretty much in. And uh, some click tracks and I told them, okay, the rhythm section, I told them, okay, just take the, uh, take the ideas, wherever, wherever it's written in the charts, do it as it's written, all the rest, just take the, the vibe and do it even better. Yeah, and, and that's how it was in the end. Um, I think uh, it was a good way to work, even if it's challenging to do it sometimes online. Um, and maybe maybe if, we, if I worked with Marco in person, it would be even better in the sense it would be a little bit more lively and everything, but all in all, I'm very happy with the results. So yeah, it was a process, but uh, in the end, uh, it turned out really great. Yeah. <clears throat> I I I was able to see Marco perform uh, 2017. He performed with Satriani here in Singapore, actually. So I was able uh -huh. to see that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. the amazing yeah. drama, actually. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah he is, he is incredible. Right. <clears throat> so uh, the for the album, the you know somewhere in the universe and then space. Uh, what's the fascination you are behind this album? Like, 
you, I see that you have some sort of a fascination about space and uh, uh, so can you explain to me a little bit about that? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, uh, well, I, I've been thinking about that. Why is it? Um, and the truth is that I was never a big sci-fi fan, uh, at least in movies and books and all, all these themes that are not in music, at least. I was never really attracted to that more than the average person. Okay, it's nice to yeah. see that, you know, and I like Star Trek and and all these things. But I was never a Trekkie, you know? Like, uh, or I grew up with the next generation and all that, but I was never a Trekkie or, or a huge fan of Star Wars or whatever. You know, I, I was just enjoying it like everyone else. Right. But the music, for some reason, it just took me to very personal places. Um, and maybe because of the, you know, of the vast uh, bigness, greatness, of universe of space of all these concepts makes me feel like i am big you know right and uh, maybe, maybe it's because um i have a lot of criticism about uh, our society so space is an opportunity to just get away i cannot really analyze myself you know right. but, but i i could come up with possible reasons why i'm so fascinated musically with these things and also the fact that the possibilities are endless for a good reason you know like like right. because it's space you can use the, the craziest scales and the craziest rhythms and you have a good thematic reason reason to do that you know so um yeah it's in a sense it's an it's an outlet right it's an opening for all kinds of creativity that can happen of course with other themes too but in space it has you know, it has a good uh, motivation. Right. <clears throat> so the so the vocals you did for that song somewhere in the universe, uh, was that song written with vocals or it came later on? No, no, it was was vocal. It, like it was with vocals from the first moment on. Right. Um, with universe the tune, I I just sat here in the studio a whole day, not composing or anything. I just. Uh, I don't remember, but I guess I, I worked on some production or mix or, or something like that, and I practiced. But after so many hours, the the creative uh, flow starts, and then in the evening, I just took up the mic and plugged the guitar in, and started to sing and play. And um, the people who supported the album on uh, Pledge Music that was a website for um, um, crowdfunding music projects. They have also a special edition of the album with the, the demos that I did, some of them. Mm. And one of them is that recording. And the vocals were there from the beginning because this is, like I said in the beginning, uh, like the backbone of the tune has to be there from the first moment on. You cannot right. have it later. After you think about all kinds of things, you know, like you have to have that. And that's exactly what I did. I just took the guitar, sang it, and at least the main themes, uh, of course there are, like it's a, it's a complicated tune, there are other themes, there's a solo, and then there's the game parts, all these things happened later, but at least the main theme was there. And that, that in itself, if it's strong enough, then it drives everything else uh, very nicely in. So yeah, the vocals were always there. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so whose whose idea was to use the like like you know where the NASA overalls for the music videos? That was really <laughs> cool idea. Yeah, that was that, yeah, that was mine. Yeah, yeah. I mean, but it's just um, like the video is just uh, complementary to the music, right? So right. it's all about space. Obviously, it's it's not like a far fetched idea. To, to dress up like astronauts, and I wish I had a decent helmet. It's quite expensive to buy, but but uh, if I did, then I probably would also take the videos with a helmet. Who knows? Maybe life. We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, so you we're work with. Do, and of course, we're going to do this live too. Yeah, we're whenever that happens, we're going to perform live uh, with. Um, with the astronaut suits, but we'll probably talk about the plans for the future uh, in a few, in, in a minute. <laughs> yeah, so uh, you work with Marco and 
who do you uh, is there anybody that you would like to work with in your future songs yeah i mean too many <laughs> <laughs> i mean i mean you know like like it's it's great to work with people who have name uh first of all because of their talent of course i, I would never work with someone just because of their name right. without it uh, having anything to do with my music or anything to add to the music of course not that but um uh, marketing wise promotion wise of course uh, having the name marco miniman on the album and in the videos having him uh of course that is uh, helping yeah it's helpful um and uh yeah, I mean, I mean, if I tell you one name, then other names will escape me, and I don't want to <laughs> right, do right, it. Right. <laughs> right. And also, also, who knows? Maybe they will tell me, "Hey, your music sucks. We don't want to even work with you, or whatever." Right. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, like, like some of them are names, and some of them are not so big names. You might not even have heard about them before. I mean, I mean, also. Uh, there is a matter of practicality like like for example um for live i cannot really have big names um uh, in the band because i cannot for example fly someone like marco from the states uh, yeah. to europe just for a couple of gigs with uh, 100 people in or whatever right i'm not you know it's not like we have a half a year tour like they do with the aristocrats that i can justify this financially yeah. and also he cannot do it, you know but um yeah, so you know, like there are great talents which are not so famous, and I can work with them, and that's what I'm going to do. You know, like uh, there is a guy called Simon Schröder. He lives in Hanover. Um, he's an incredible drummer, amazing. And uh, unfortunately, because of this COVID crap, we couldn't really uh, do anything together. But we always wanted to, and hopefully next year, or the year after that, we will. You know, so yeah. And um, yeah, there were like, like there are many ideas that I have, mm. kind of like when a when a composer writes for someone specific, like for a specific singer, for example. Then you know it's more like about the ideas first, um, and then I'm I will think about who can do it the best. Right. And it's not just about space. I have other ideas too. Um, we we will probably talk about that, but. Uh, you know, it's it's a band that might be more in the, I wouldn't say avant, but it's kind of fusing in more avant ideas uh, into metal mm. uh, or whatever. And, and then I have to really find out the right people for the job, you know? In the end, the music is, is most important, not the people, not even me. You know, to me, we all serve an end, a name, uh, which is the music itself. Right. Uh, if I ever yeah. find out that if I ever find out that some composition of mine is not best played by me, I have no problem uh, that someone else will do it instead. You know, I'll 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 be more than happy with that. Right. <clears throat> what I really love about the so you have prog and then you have the people who does fusion like Marco and then Jordan Ruders, uh, Derek Sherinan, yeah. and all these guys who who do a lot of. Uh, collaborations with a lot of artists it's it's really very good because they sort of uh, uh, introduce a lot of new artists to the to the major like people who just listen to progressive music right so because I I, I got to know a lot of bands because of uh, these guys are working with so many sometimes not even from Europe or America they even work with the people in Asia as well so it's really really good that fusion world is really interesting actually it is and it's uh, so much is happening you know uh i think uh of course there are incredible players out there and uh, <clears throat> and uh, also the creativity is still flowing it's not one of these genres that is um that has ended in the sense that okay uh, like this is how you play it and that's it not at mm. all not at all and i think i think that's because um the spirit of fusion is really always to be open right open to anything new influences to new directions to new visions and that's why uh some of the most visionary musicians are are in that field of course it's not the only one mm. 
but uh, yeah, jazz is still alive. I mean, jazz itself, right? Things are still happening, and in a sense, everything is fusion nowadays. Right. Um, yeah, but and and prog is still alive. You know, people who tell you that prog died in the seventies or eighties or nineties—that's nonsense, really. I mean, it's still alive. Uh, you know, any any genre that people still want, like not even thinking, just want to think creatively about, is still alive. Right. You know? Right. Yeah. <clears throat> you are like I saw I I saw a lot of your videos. Uh, you were you were wearing a meshuga T-shirt. Uh, <laughs> can you tell me a little bit about meshuga? <laughs> yeah, meshuga. I mean, uh, they are one of my greatest influences, or at least um, I would say the earliest, because you know I didn't discover them when I started to, to pick up the guitar and play. Right. But uh, right about the time that I discovered Cynic and Prog and Fusion and all that, and the Shuga was just there, of course, you know, and uh, their their uh, musical and especially rhythmical talent. Is incredible, of course. Right. To me, I always compare them in my mind to someone like Stravinsky, uh, in the sense of the rhythmic um, vision and complexity. Even though, uh, you know, Friedrich uh, is always asked about this in interviews and stuff, and he always says, "Yeah, most of our rhythms are just four fours, you know, four quarters." Right. And it's true. And it's true. Most of it is, but inside what's happening inside the polymetrics the polyrhythms all that stuff you know you cannot like you, you cannot ignore it right it's an like an intrinsic part of the music right and that that's one of the reasons why i like them other than just being a great band really tight doing metal as it should sound uh, all that stuff you know which there are not many but there are some bands who do that right but uh, they have their edge and an incredible one. I think Frederick is an incredible musician and uh, and uh, very visionary and of course an incredible guitarist. Right. And, uh, and all of them are amazing players. Yeah. So it's one of my favorite metal bands, definitely. definitely. Right. <laughs> because uh, <laughs> this uh, looking at your t-shirt got me wanted to go back and check my sugar again, watch some videos yesterday and uh, like I watched Bleed again one like several times and damn that how what they do with the drums on that song is so crazy, right? <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. There's so much uh, going on there. Uh, Thomas Hacker is incredible, really. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, and and just the other day, I found this little video and I posted part of it on my page um, of uh, Meshuga's uh, light guy, like the, the guy who runs the lights and stuff. Nowadays, they don't have one anymore. Yeah. Uh, they used to work with uh, Thomas' cousin, as it turns out. Uh, someone told me that it was, uh, his name is Edvard, um, and uh, he's Thomas' cousin, and, and he used to actually play those parts on... On the on the lights console, so that it was perfectly in sync. But I always thought, yeah, they probably programmed that because they're all in click and stuff like that. But they were not always uh, programming it. That that was my surprise. To my surprise, uh, I, I just saw this video and I see a guy playing Meshuga on on the lights console, you know, <laughs> and it's incredible. You can, you can check it out on my page. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, I saw that. Uh... <laughs> oh, you saw that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's fucking amazing, you know, and. And then someone told me, yeah, they used to have that, but they don't do it anymore because since they are always uh, playing on, on click, they don't really need it. They can just program it and that's it. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> Still very, very impressive. You know, to, to play Meshuggah on any kind of device is impressive. <laughs> <laughs> so you all, so you, uh, you have your debut album and then uh, what's your plan for the future? What, uh, what, uh, what's upcoming? So uh, right now I'm working on a live set for, for the music um, because we didn't really have a chance to play it live, of course. Uh, so hopefully next year something will happen in the summer, I hope. And, uh, and that means that I have to prepare a lot of the, a lot of the, of that stuff that you hear in the album. Uh, I have to prepare it for live. 
right. playing wise of course uh, i know the parts more or less but uh, i want to practice them so that they're they sound good live too but also um in production sense uh i need to get the backing tracks um and determine what goes where a live mix is not exactly the same as an album mix you don't have the stereo image so wide usually all these things um they, they they need to happen they need to be prepared so that's what i'm working on right now um and uh once that is happening which will probably take me a couple of months once that is in i will start um maybe thinking or conceiving more uh, like some different projects one of the things that i have in mind which is really a concept right now i don't really have any music written for it um is a band which is um like i said it's Kind of more avant-garde-ish. I mean, think Mr. Bungle, but more metal. Um, and the real idea there is to take um, to take content, textual content, which is not really songs even. It's more like dialogues or monologues, or ma probably mainly monologues, and really present them um, in the acting sense. So it has to be a vocalist who's really a good actor. You know, like also a good actor and can present the songs and the texts in a very, um, you know, in a very extroverted manner, which I cannot, I would not be able to do even if I were a vocalist because I'm just not that kind of guy. So right. I need to find someone who can work me. But I do have like, like the, the, the contents of this thing are much more, let's say, upset and criticizing of what's going on in society uh, than the escapistic kind of works that I did until now with the universe and all this. It's much more dealing with stuff. Right. Um, I'll, I don't know if I will end up writing the lyrics. It's not even lyrics. It's more like, think about the, the angry posts on Facebook on music, you know? That's what, that's what I want to do, you know? Plus some mad stuff like like toys, like like power tools. Maybe we'll drill with a huge driller inside the floor of the stage. Uh, maybe, <laughs> you know, maybe we'll get uh, endorsed by Bosch. Maybe right. <laughs> all that, you know, all that bullshit. I want to do that, you know. Um, and, uh, and 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 yeah, like it it will be completely, in in a sense, it will be completely different than what I did until now. I want it to be much more much dirtier um but then again because it's really monologues uh we, we we have to be super tight it would it will have to sound kind of dirty in the end mm. but between us the, the players it will have to be super tight because if someone reads out a monologue uh think about like zap a jet from hell you know or or the, the song yeah uh, or um uh, no not sorry not jazz from hell the dangerous kitchen you know mm. the dangerous kitchen right so it's kind of like a monologue, but it's really played. It's incredible. Or the jazz discharge uh, party hats. Um, so that kind of stuff, plus all the craziness around, more distorted guitar metal stuff, you know. Yeah, that's. I can. I mean, I can describe it as as much as I want, but until it's actually happening, it's really hard to say what is going to be in the end. Yeah. <clears throat> right. So you all, uh, what's your messages to the people who support you, listen to your music? Uh, keep supporting me, keep listening to my music, and uh, <laughs> and uh, and go vegan, go vegan <laughs> for the animals, for the planet, and for yourself. <laughs> right. <laughs> no, I'm not saying. I mean, I mean, I really like like that that, that project I told you about. That's one of my main motivation is um, to drive the, the activist message, because I'm also an animal activist. Uh, I was involved with some li animal liberation projects. Some of them were huge and successful. I was really happy to take part of that, to be a part of that. Um, and, and I want to incorporate that into, into my musicality. You know that the COVID-19 pandemic, it didn't start from vegetables and tomatoes. Right. It started with the animal industry. Some, you know, some all not just uh, this pandemic, by the way. All the pandemics, like all the SARS and MERS and 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 crazy cow and and uh, whatnot. You know, all these things, the, the swine flu, um, all these things start from the animal industry. 
Right. Uh, so we should end this shit, you know, once and for all. And if I can do it through music, because that's my strongest way to express things, then so be it, you know, I want to do that. It's not just about that, but it's part of it, you know, like the, the, the way society lives right now, I don't like it at all. <laughs> right. I mean, yeah, and I'm very criti critical about this, this stuff. And I think that it's uh, very much missing in, in the kind of genres that I'm involved in. Most of them are really about fantasy, which is great because it provides the escape. And that's what I did as well. Right. But us artists, we, we cannot just sit back and, and uh, not be involved anymore. We have to step in. I think. Yeah. Because, I mean, you cannot just live in the fantasy all the time, right? You have to look at the world also sometimes, right? Like, yeah, I mean, yes. I mean, look look at what's going on around us. It, it gets to each and every one of us. It used to be only that people, you know, in, in some sweatshops or animals or, or some, you know, some pieces of earth far away from us were, were the victims. Right. And very, very fast, actually, we are becoming also the victims. So people should open their eyes finally, because it gets to them personally, finally, and, and, and just uh, start doing, start being active and change. That's, that's my message. Uh, if you're asking about messages, that's right. my message. <laughs> right. <laughs> so you are, anybody you want to shout out to? Yeah, I mean, the, the guys like uh, who were with me in the album and uh, really made an incredible work. I really want to appreciate that and I still appreciate it very much. Um, uh, yeah, friends, family, <laughs> and, uh, and my favorite musicians, all the, mu all the incredible musicians that we talked about. Thank you so much, you know, for being such a great influence and inspiration right <clears throat> yeah, shout out to you so you all uh, this is uh, great to talk to you and uh, i'm glad that i'm talking to you so thank you for joining the podcast i really enjoyed uh, this uh, conversation uh, so looking forward to your more music <laughs> and uh, keep making great music uh, just tell everyone how they can follow you on social media and then how, how they can listen to your music so um, I'm basically everywhere, like in all the major social media outlets. So just look up Yuval Ron, my name, Yuval, Y-U-V-A-L, and the last name is R-O-N, Yuval Ron. Um, and there are, of course, a few people with that name, not just the other musician, but you will find me very easily because I wear an astronaut suit on the picture. So it's an Instagram and Facebook. Um, I'm not using Twitter so much anymore, but uh, YouTube, of course. You can just do youtube.com uh, slash Yuval Ron um, and my website, of course, mailing list. Um, you can check my music on my website or on Bandcamp, yuvalron.bandcamp.com. So basically everything, everything is there in one of the, either my website or YouTube or uh, Bandcamp. Right. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> yes, you, you are. So thanks for thanks again. Uh, so have a great day ahead. So talk to you soon. <laughs> it's been a pleasure. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you.